a playlist original. Hey everyone, Jeff here from Films at Home. Thanks for coming back to the channel and the podcast today. Uh, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening along on your favorite podcast apps, I appreciate all the support. This is a special Christmas episode of the Films at Home podcast uh, because we are talking to Brian Levant, who is the director of my favorite Christmas movie of all time, Jingle all the way. So this was super cool that he was willing to come on and have a conversation. We had a really good chat about Jingle All the Way and some of his other movies and his career because he's been a director, writer, producer in Hollywood for for years. He did uh, work on Happy Days, Mork and Mindy, the new Leave It to Beaver. He directed the Flintstones in the Flintstones uh, sequel, live action movies. He directed Beethoven, Jingle All the Way, Are We There Yet, Snow Dogs. He's done a lot of movies, worked on a lot of different TV shows, worked with a lot of great people. So we dove into all that, but we talked a lot about Jingle All the Way because this is the Christmas episode. This is going to post on December 23rd. That's when you guys are going to hear it. And I just love that movie. I love everything about it. It's such a great snapshot in time of... The, the mid nineties, the nostalgia, the cast, we got into how that all came together, the improvisation, the comedy, um, the marketing and the promotion of it and sort of how it became a, uh, a cult favorite over the years. Uh, you know, thanks to a lot of physical media sales, VHS tapes really uh, drove, I think a lot of the nostalgia and the, and the cult following this movies developed. So that was really interesting. And then we also talked about his own collection. He's a massive toy collector. He has over six, thousand unique toys in his collection spanning all uh, kinds of different decades in pop culture movies tv shows um some of the stuff he's worked in some stuff he just really loves like popeye uh, he's got flintstones toys jingle all the way toys he's got all this great stuff so he's a super uh, cool collector and he actually wrote a book called my life in toys and that's a, a amazing coffee table book. It's like 400 pages. It has thousands of high res photographs, stories about some of the toys and why he collects them and different, you know, behind the scenes on things that he's worked on. So it's a great book that I'd highly recommend. And I'll link in the video description. So we get into a little bit of that and his collection and what he thinks about collecting. But we talk a lot about Jingle All the Way. So if you're like me and you love Jingle All the Way, this is the Christmas episode for you. And it was such an honor to talk to Brian. So sit back, enjoy the interview here, Brian super cool i think you guys will really like them and i'll talk to you all at the end all right everyone we're here with brian levant director producer writer extraordinaire um and the director of i've told you guys this in my channel my favorite christmas movie of all time jingle all the way so this is a very timely interview for me having watched it a few times already this december so brian thanks for uh thanks for coming on really oh, appreciate it. this it, it, it is my pleasure. Uh, the the uh, Phoenix-like uh, revival of Jingle All the Way has been uh, tremendously satisfying, uh, not just to me, but everyone involved with the film. Uh, when it was first released in, in mid-November 1996, it was... Uh, 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 mercilessly uh, torn apart by every critic in America had, had, had their Thanksgiving dinner on, uh, uh, on, on, on what they saw as a turkey. Uh, and uh, the box office was disappointing, even though there were some good things like our second weekend being bigger than our first, which is a very difficult thing in, in the movie business. But facing the competition that we had that was marketed so extremely well, we were sandwiched in between in between Space Jam and mm. and uh, 101 Dalmatians, the first Disney uh, live action adaptation of one of their animated films, mm -hmm. uh, and and those were films where they the marketing was superb. Uh, these things, the these prop properties, the studio saw as 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 major tent poles and. Uh, their tie-ins uh, were endless. Uh, their media campaigns were relentless. Uh, Space Jam, you know, ended up with a hit song. Uh, Glenn Close, you know, her, her career came back to life with this exceptional Cruella de Vil. 
And 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 I always felt that that you know that Fox, like in March of uh, of of ninety six. Uh, uh, said, "Wait a second! We don't have a Christmas movie," uh, and, uh, and and grabbed one off the woodpile and gave it to Chris Columbus, who was angling to become, a, 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 you know, after his successes uh, in, in directing with, uh, uh, you know, his films for John Hughes, Home Alone, Home Alone Two, and Adventures in Babysitting, and and Mrs. Doubtfire, uh, you know, wanted to uh, do what what. People like Spielberg and Ivan Reitman did. They produced the, you know, films that they made and by others. Uh, and this was the first venture like that. And and so, you know, uh, I'm not going to say mistakes were, were made other than other than making the movie. <laughs> um, but but you know, we never could compete on uh, on the level that drew people without any knowledge or interest, you know, like how many, six, how, how many six-year-old girls went to see Space Jam because they're big basketball fans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they knew they had to see it. Anyways, and, and so we suffered. Uh, the film grossed $61 million domestically and strangely enough, $61 million overseas. And at the time that was not, you know, Beethoven was a, a huge hit overseas with $80 million now. So this was a film that they thought would be in triple figures, uh, domestically, internationally, uh, you know, and, and it didn't perform. Uh, uh, and, 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 and it's, uh, it's reputation since then, its viewership has only uh, grown and the appreciation for the film has noticeably changed in, in, in the media. And, and, and I think people, you know, the other night I went to a 26th anniversary screening uh, by the American cinema tech, uh, you know, and, and at the Los Feliz theater, uh, with, with, uh, with a, a group of, of huge fans, a large group, uh, and, and, uh, their appreciation for the film, uh, this core audience has uh, has helped it to to extend it the film's reach, and I'm shocked when I see things. I was just notified that it's one of the hottest uh, things on Hulu. That it's a top five uh, show on Stars uh, and and all their and all their streaming and, and all their channels and everything. So some something's changed, and 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 uh, I'm thrilled. Uh, about it, I'm thrilled that we found an audience, and that, and that that people embrace the the comedy and the characters, and it really was a a, a great great cast. Uh, we were very lucky uh, to put that cast together, and I think you know getting getting Arnold. I think Chris had a lot to do with that, but 20 million speaks pretty good. Well, uh, <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, and I was coming off the Flintstones, which was a, a monstrously worldwide sensation. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, when I did that film, uh, Spielberg uh, asked one thing of me. And that was, show me something I've never seen before. And we tried to show him something in every shot. <laughs> uh, and, and, and create a world and create something special. And, and. You know, we, we tried to rise that high in, in Jingle, uh, but the, uh, like Turbo Man fell to earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that is that is what I want. Do you have any sense of like where where this revival came from? Because for me, I think about it and I, <clears throat> I was too young to have seen it in the theaters. So I probably saw it for uh-huh. the first time. I was maybe seven, eight years old. We had a VHS copy. Like that's how I caught on to it, and then just but who bought the copy? It. Did you have older brothers, <laughs> sisters, your parents? Got- my parents picked it up. Yeah, really. They, they picked it up. I don't know if my my dad just saw Arnold and said, "Okay, this must be you know this will be fun." Um, but yeah, I just I don't know where it came from, but I just remember having it and then watching it nonstop. And so then as I grew up, I mean, do you find that a lot of the audience is? Oh, in their late 20s uh, well, 30s mo- mo- uh, the the most 
enthusiastic seemed to be people who saw it originally in the theaters. And, and those who were moved to buy a, uh, a, a the 14 inch talking Turbo Man action figure, uh, a Walmart exclusive, which, uh, which by the way, here's a movie about the hottest toy in America. We thought we were gonna have the hottest toy in America. Those the Turbo Men were still sitting there marked down in March. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, and who would think that, you know, 25 years later, Funko would re-release it, uh, an exact duplicate, although the box is a little smaller, uh, and, uh, and, and a full line of, of Jingle All the Way uh, Funko Pop figures as well. But, but, you know, I started to sense something about 20 years ago. When, when I'd be speaking on campuses, and I, and I teach at two universities and have spoken at many, many, and uh, people were, the only thing anyone would ever bring me to sign were their families' VHS copies of Jingle All the Way uh, that were worn, and, and they started to tell me how it would became an annual event in their homes. And... Uh, and and and, it, and it's just continued to snowball. And as people get into their into their thirties and they have kids of their own, you want to share the the things that uh, excited you that are appropriate to show your kid. You know, you don't need to show them in glorious bastards, but uh, <laughs> but right. but you know, Jingle is a is a lovely PG movie about how fallible fathers can be. <laughs> uh, well, no, and, the, uh, the great thing about it too is that. Even as I just I just turned thirty and I'm watching it now, I get as many laughs. I might get more laughs out of it now than I did when I was younger because there is a lot of like, it is PG, but there's a lot of humor that speaks to you as an adult and I'm, like everything Phil Hartman's got going on just uh, cracks yeah. you up as you get old. It kind of flies over your head a little bit as a kid, but I, I cracks can you see up that. as you get I can older. See that. No, Phil, you know Phil had originally read for the role of Myra, part that uh, we gave to Sinbad. And, uh, and it, it, he wasn't that person. Uh, and, uh, and, and I said, hey, you know, we got this other part. Maybe, maybe you'll take a look at it. And, uh, you know, Chris was in the room, so he probably didn't want to say, no, no, that's a smaller part. Uh, I'm not interested. Uh, instead, he, uh, he dove right in and without even looking over the pages, uh, read the part, had us laughing so hard and at the end you know you, well i guess we found some value in that uh and uh, uh and then he was perfect and and i always say about phil that i have never known anybody who enjoyed their wealth or their their fame more than he did uh you know it, it tickled him i don't think he ever expected it <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for many years, you know, the biggest thing he did was, uh, was Captain Carl on Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> yes. Um, so I did, I did want to know what the, what the cast that you had, you had, you had Sinbad, you had Phil, you had Arnold, you had Rita Wilson. How, how much of it was, how much of it was scripted? How much of it was them just kind of playing off of each other and having fun? Well, well, uh, there are lines that Phil created, Sinbad created, uh, you know, Arnold, Arnold, you know, uh, showed up the first day and knew every line of his and everyone else's to tell you the truth, to give you an idea of the kind of discipline, uh, uh and preparation that he had. Um, but the casting process, uh, started when they, uh, I think originally when they first talked about this film, Chris Columbus saw it as, as a uh, a vehicle, uh, mid budget, you know, twenty five, thirty million dollars, uh, a name, not a star. Danny Stern, an average man, you, you know, um, and and then someone got the idea in the in the executive building at, at 20th Century Fox Studios uh, to to use it as a vehicle to reteam Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, uh, and if it was me, I would have gone after them together <laughs> that they, they landed Arnold and then went after Danny and Arnold said yes. And Danny said, no, 
and and so that really set off uh, a, 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 a difficult casting challenge to find somebody uh, who who was strong enough to uh, play opposite Arnold and wild enough uh, uh, to to be the character and uh, and Sinbad was was. Uh, very clever, very fast on his feet, uh, and, and and you know, you know, some, someone told me about that. There's an online theory that, that Sinbad didn't even have a son. <laughs> <laughs> I could, you know what? I could see that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but but uh, you know, so so he 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 could play he could play off the ball. You know, he was creating uh, on his own and 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 and. and in using the script, but embellishing and embellishing his character, and, and keep taking it up a notch, uh, which challenged which challenged uh, Arnold and, and Arnold's character as well. Uh, and I, well, the other thing I liked about Sinbad was he he's not a small man, and, and uh, uh, you know that that you know when you're when you're fighting over a telephone in the diner. Uh, um, you, you know, you don't want to see him beating up Michael J. Fox. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, you know they, they were kind of evenly matched and Sinbad got his licks in uh, on occasion uh, in, in the physical melees and stuff. Um, but in, And he was having a, a great time when we were shooting in Minneapolis. He was hanging out, you know, at the Paisley Park crowd. <laughs> So what did you do this? Well, we went to the Timberwolves game. How about you? Oh, I was I was up at Princess. What? 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 <laughs> you, well, take me, take me. <laughs> uh, and uh, and you know, and Phil, Phil, uh, such a sweet man. And uh, and what happened to him is is so sad. Uh, watching the film the other night, uh, I started to think, really, kind of for the first time of of you know how robbed we were as an audience and how robbed he was uh there's no telling where he would have gone i mean for instance think about phil hartman as walter white in breaking bad <laughs> you know i mean i mean there really could have been some major surprises and fun and he was just so i hate to say it so full of life uh, uh and, and vitality and and just joy uh, constantly. Uh, I, and the only times he ever had spoken of his wife who murdered him and then took her own life uh, was in context of getting her to, getting the kids to like things and and then hoping that she would be forced to come along. Like, he loved he loved boating. He had a big big boat, you know. Go to Catalina, not a sailboat, a motorboat. Uh, and, and the kids and the kids were crazy about it. And he was, he was trying to hook her into it. It was always it was always like trying to make her part of their family. And 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 it was a little strange. Uh, uh, but you know, I don't think anybody was prepared for uh, what happened. Uh, no. Uh, on, on a brighter note, uh, you know. Uh, Rita Wilson, uh, who I'd worked with twice uh, on Happy Days, playing different parts. I think she she actually had met Tom Hanks uh, when she was doing Happy Days, and he was doing Bosom Buddies <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the lot together. Uh, you know, probably at the commissary or something. Uh, and uh, Tom did an episode of Happy Days too, and played with and him him and Peter Scolari both played for the. Happy Days softball team on occasion. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, and and I thought the, the I think the main reason we we went with Rita is because you really believed that she would, could be married to an A list star, <laughs> sure. and and yeah. know how to handle them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and, and, and she did. Uh, and. Uh, Jim Belushi, uh, uh, who, who was my my sister in law's next door neighbor in Chicago, known him a long <laughs> time, uh, and uh, you know he had originally come in for Myron. He and Arnold had done Red Heat together, yep, uh, and, and they were good buddies. And, and I like Jim. Uh, I think we we liked the idea uh, uh, of Sinbad. Uh, it was it was a close call, 
really. Uh, and we offer Jim, you know, as, 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 a, as a gesture, you know, you want Santa Claus. <laughs> and he threw himself into that. And Danny Woodburn, uh, you probably know better from Seinfeld, is Tony the Elf, uh, mm -hmm. uh, was just hysterical, just hysterical. Uh, and, and, and to have Robert Conrad, who I first started watching in 1959, I think, on yeah. Hawaiian Eye, and was a huge Wild Wild West fan. And, and he had never done anything remotely funny in his entire life. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sorry that people didn't take advantage of that afterwards because he really could have had, you know, a Leslie Nielsen-ish oh, yeah. uh, ki kind of career uh, playing ultra straight uh, <laughs> in, in comedies. And, and, uh, and he was a good guy. He really was. Bob, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the cat, I mean, that's, the cast is just incredible when you really look at it. And it is to me, I look at it. I was telling my, my brother, we watch this movie all the time. This is like our movie. And I was just like, if you look at this on paper, it looks like it, there's Arnold and Sinbad and Phil Hartman. It's like, how did that all come together? But it, it just, it Oh, because uh, the, we had a lot of money. Uh, yeah, the film well, cost $84 million. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, and we, we had a big second unit to, I mean, with helicopters on occasion and, 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 and marching bands and, and thousands oh, and yeah. thousands of extras uh, and shot in Minnesota and on the back lot uh, of Universal. Originally, you know, Chris Columbus and, and his producing partner, Mark Radcliffe, had never actually made a film at a studio. Uh, and I really literally grew up behind studio walls and really knew how to utilize uh, uh, this, the studio facilities, the back lots and, and you know, and, and having shot there for, 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 you know, like eight years at that point, <laughs> you know, I, I knew the place inside out and, and, uh, and it really helped in putting together the parade and, and other, and other stuff that, that we shot both at, at Fox and uh, and uh, on the back lot uh, at Universal, um, and you know Minnesota. I I still I, I sometimes I think only, mainly because I was so freezing when we first started scouting there. <laughs> why why are we doing this? So we ended up having to bring snow to Minneapolis. A guy from Wisconsin who made who made it's really ice, uh, uh, you know, who made snow. And I said, we could have done this in Studio City. <laughs> yeah, right. And you, yeah. Cause you, you guys shot through what, from March through to... No, no, was... well, I, you know, I'm, I'm actually a little vague uh, on the date. Uh, if, if you back in, if you back in, so we were released mid-November, and that mm. was after, I believe, there was no more than 14 weeks of post, period. And, yeah, it's and, a quick turnaround, uh, right? That's what uh, I read. It was ridiculous. Yeah, turnaround. And and in those days, shooting on film, you had to time uh, the shot mm -hmm. uh, in order in order to execute uh, uh, the work on the computer, so that uh, you couldn't you couldn't rematch it to the film. Now 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 everything's done in the computer and afterwards. Uh, but still, you know, you need you need reference. But we had to give exact uh, color, color uh, printing uh, uh, dimensions, orders, whatever you call it, which which means you have to edit it. So you can't do the shot until it's cut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you gotta you gotta do the cut, and then then the DP's got to come in and time it, and then they go through, and, and they had acquired the the visual effects company who did the the VFX had been acquired as part of. The, their acquisition of Blue Sky Animated Studios, uh, okay. and but but they really weren't interested in them. And so to keep them busy or to test them, they gave them to us, and they really did not do a good job. I I mean, the first time they ever brought us a, a Turbo Man <laughs> flying shot, he he was he was flying at, at, at about at what looked like about two miles an hour. You know, uh, and, 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 you know, we started laughing as soon as we saw it and they quickly pulled out the cassette. OK, OK, that's obviously wrong. We'll, we'll go back to work. Uh, but there was a lot of that, a lot of that. 
And, you know, there, there was a lot of wire removal in, in the film. There, there was a, a very few uh, full Turboman CGI shots. Uh, you lost Spider-Man today. You know, he'll be flipping it across buildings and stuff, and it's all, and it's all him. We, I would say that ninety-four uh, percent of of the all the Turbo Man sequences uh, were were captured live, either either on set, you know, for flying for close-ups. We had a camera car uh, with, with 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 a what do you call it, uh, a, a, a kind of a jib arm that, mm. that was raised that Arnold was on. And, and we just put the camera up and we'd drive to where he was flying and it would go up and down uh, hydraulically. Uh, and, and that's how we shot uh, a lot of the close-ups uh, from the flying stuff. But uh, we originally wanted the flames to be real. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> When we finally we did a test and and we looked at it, we go, "Wow, that looks great," but <laughs> but do you really want to put a bomb on the back of your star? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, because let's face it, flames needed gas and mm-hmm. gas compressed cartridges. Yeah, it worked. Actually, the CGI flames were bigger and brighter, so so that that was successful. Um, but but you know it, it was a very ambitious undertaking for because of the post schedule so backing in so so 12 14 weeks from from mid november puts you where like before labor day right yeah just about yeah okay so we would have uh we we came back from minneapolis and shot the parade uh and, and so all that stuff uh we we were working on you know our editors worked uh, minimum six days a week, most weeks, seven, uh, during the entire production and post-production just to keep up. Um, and, uh, and so, so that would put us 84 days of shooting is, so, so add (laughs) 85 days is how many weeks? Just, uh, Uh, I'm sorry, 85 days is how many weeks? (laughs) 12. 12 weeks. Okay. Seven so 12 weeks, 12 to 84. Okay. Except, except you're only shooting five days a week. Right. Right. Yeah. So, 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 so it's really like, mm. like 16 weeks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So four months back from, <laughs> from, from September <clears throat> mean, means we shar- started shooting in like May, uh, which oh. gives you an idea of why you needed uh, uh, snow in Minneapolis. We yep. did pay the city to leave their Christmas decorations up in a couple places, <laughs> you know, which That's... must have been very confusing if you lived there, but uh, worked very well for us. <laughs> yeah, I just can't imagine that term. So you're shooting in May, in November of that year. This is in theaters at the box office, right? Uh, and that is, and that's and, incredible. And, uh, not really, not really. <laughs> I, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of times when you're doing a half hour of TV. That would get shoved out, in, in, yeah, you know, in, in five seven days if you have to, you know. It, it, it uh, Lowell Ganza uh, once said that writing was like gas in a bottle; it'll expand to however much room you give it. Uh, and and uh, the same thing is it can be contracted. You always, you you always see movies that were shot in twenty three days, you know, fourteen days. Yeah. You, you know, you do. What you, what you can uh, with the time you have, and uh, and and I do think that that uh, uh, I don't think it hurt the movie, but it didn't help. You know, there wasn't uh, there wasn't time to 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 really consider a lot of things. We had to act and act fast. Yeah. Do you and, think it the did you lose time on sort of promotion? Because I know I like. Would, do you wish you would have? Well, done more? it wasn't a matter of promotion. It, it was a matter of marketing. That everywhere you looked, that that there was Space Jam. There was right. 101 Dalmatians, and uh, I don't even I, I can't remember what any other studios holiday releases were <laughs> uh, at, at that time. Uh, but certainly, you know, all the promotional partners, you know, we, you know, you have to make a McDonald's deal a year and a half. Ahead. Right. Space Jam had an incredible one. 
you know. Yeah. Uh, D- Disney, I think, had Burger King. They had, you know, they mm-hmm. had huge tie-ins uh, at, at their amusement parks, uh, at, at, through through their other TV. Uh, they owned ABC at the time, didn't they? <laughs> um, I, I think they did. You know, there was so. no, you know, you know. They they, they worked it. Nobody works yeah. it better than they do when they're at the top of their game. And, and so, so, you know, I think that because the film uh, was rushed out and, and because they spent so much on the film and Chris, Chris wasn't interested in cutting corners. He wanted to, to be a producer of high quality entertainment, which he equated with, I'm going to get whatever I ask for financially. And that's why, you know, what film has a hundred thousand dollar cigar budget, you know? <laughs> yep so do you uh, still um when you watch it back now yes do you still do you still enjoy it and is there anything you would I, have changed it, it, it's really funny that uh over the years i i am bothered less by the things that always bothered me mm-hmm. and and also uh the fact that you know, time heals uh, all, all all wounds. Uh, it, it can't it can't displace the trauma <laughs> uh, that, sure. that 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 it caused. Uh, but but I, and and for a while, I I would pretty predictably fall asleep at a certain point <laughs> too. And that didn't happen Thursday night. I'm glad, even though I was sitting in the back and no one would have seen me. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you know it so well. You've seen it so many times. It, it, but I am enjoying it more uh, because, and because it's working. Yeah, it's working, and the audience is responding exactly the way that you would always have wanted them to, and didn't always. And mm-hmm. it did did so erratically during its initial run. It's funny. Some scenes would get applause, and then other things would just sit there. And today everything's working. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, but I mean, a lot of that has to come from the familiarity and you look forward to things, you know, it's like when you see a big joke in a trailer uh, enough times, <laughs> right. Uh, uh, you start looking forward to it in the movie. Right. Um, and, and, and I do think that they made a major marketing error in the way they promoted the film. They, they ignored Turbo Man. There, mm-hmm. there is, there is, you know, Turbo Man is a da, is a figure in, in the box rather than seeing Arnold in the getup. You know, um, there's an artist by the name who goes by the name of uh, Rocky Davies who who did a uh, an alter an alternate poster for uh, L.A.'s Gallery in, uh, 1988, uh, which does superb pop culture art, uh, and and it's and it's. Arnold in the, in the outfit with a black background, holding the turbo ring to his head, looking very serious with a turbo (laughs) man flying, shooting this and every other character from the giant uh, Santa Claus to Vern Troyer, mini me, who was the tiny Santa Claus uh, and Bob Conrad and Phil Hartman and, and, and Dementor and everything. And it's got, and I told him, I said, had this been the poster for the movie, uh, we would have made we would have made 150 million dollars <laughs> uh, because it had energy yeah. and vitality and it was showing you something that that you wanted to see but didn't know you wanted to see kind of like the rock is black adam uh, all of a sudden you see uh, somebody with real muscles uh, uh, and mm-hmm. real strength and and power and they're in their milieu <laughs> yeah yeah uh, but they they went the opposite way, and they're promoting Howard Langston, and, right? And and you know, today I'm sure it would be different because of the place the uh, the comic book hero uh, has reached in, in our society and, oh, yeah. and in the industry is the only sure bet. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, obviously the the large collection of toys behind you, right? I'm a collector. I do movies. A lot of people listening to this will be collectors. So. Sort of two part question: How did you get into collecting toys like this and pop culture, and um, what sort of influence did that have while you were making, you know, this this movie that's 
very well, much focused uh, on a on a toy. Uh, uh, good question. Good question. No, I I have a, somewhere in the neighborhood of six thousand pieces in in my collection, toys, pop culture, and and I've been you know uh, uh, collecting for. Uh, a little bit longer than I've been in the business. So really, uh, really for a half century uh, of serious collecting. I, I, I collected comics as a kid, mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, but not, not many sports cards. And I had, there were toys I had to have, that uh, must have. But I, 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 I didn't collect per se. Um, you know, a lot of people start with pinback buttons. Uh, we, my wife and I re- basically started with salt and pepper shakers, uh, which okay. uh, were, were great, uh, distinctive. Uh, some of them were, were just really a, a plastic ones, uh, uh, you, you know, character stuff, uh, you know, household items, uh, uh, croquet sets, uh, hats, all kinds, some really interesting stuff. And uh, among them was the advertising stuff, which uh, mm-hmm. Mr. Peanut salt and pepper shakers and stuff. So we, we started gravitating towards uh, 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 character character merchandising and and which bled right into collecting uh, collecting uh, the toys from from the uh, entertainments that that I enjoyed as a kid. Howdy Doody, Leave It to Beaver, the Flintstones. Never knowing that you know that I would be steering uh, the franchise. Uh, of the Flintstones and, and leave it to Beaver for for years and years, mm-hmm. and and um, and and how that influenced uh, my, my collecting and Happy Days, which I was and Mork and Mindy uh, that I produced, uh, you know, had huge huge marketing, uh, 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 toys, games, uh, sh- shirts, all kinds of, of figures, Fonzie's motorcycle, Fonzie's garage, <laughs> Mork and Mindy's Jeep, you, you know. Uh, Great, great uh, uh, amigos, all kinds of stuff. And so here I am, a ma- major toy collector, coming off a, a film that uh, where virtually all of our, our, our characters, our drawings, our vehicles, our houses, all became toys, a pinball machine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, a complete line of, of figures that took the, the wardrobe that we designed and put it on the characters. Happy Meals, sure, for the, for the Flintstones, we had McDonald's. It, it, was, it was, you know, uh, universal at, at its finest in terms of, of marketing. And, and, and never forget that uh, we rushed out a, a quick uh, teaser trailer for the Flintstones uh, that, that was attached to Jurassic Park, which had, uh, you know, a monstrous opening. Yep. Uh, and... Uh, and so here I am, and I open this script and fade in interior toy factory. <laughs> and the opening scene of the first script I read was manufacturing the Turbo Man dolls. And, you know, uh, you, know you had me at hello. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to the design the hottest toy. And I get to design a superhero costume. Yeah. I get to finally have a character who flies, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and and so filled with, with that expectation. And above all, I saw myself having what I have today, which is a big shelf filled with Turbo Man stuff. <laughs> and we got to do the comic book cover, the cereal, the lunchbox, mm-hmm. all the stuff ha- had to pass through me. And, and and we talk about the, the designing Turbo Man was uh, was uh, was uh, we went through so many steps, so many different color combinations, so many different ways uh, of outfitting uh, the, the propellants and everything. And finally, we really thought we had it. And then one day, I said, "You know, this looks a lot like Iron Man." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but anyway, so uh, and and uh, just so so people know, uh, I've spent the last eleven years photographing my collection and writing about it and its experiences in this past uh, September, uh, my life and toys, my mm-hmm. the supersized uh, book of my collections and career uh, uh, came out from G editions and, and it's uh, selling tremendously. And it's, 
Uh, I'm very, very proud. I, I not only did the writing and produced uh, the book uh, in the same way you would produce a, a, a film or a show, and I also uh, designed the book uh, with, with, uh, with uh, some collaborators who have Photoshop skills that, that, that I completely lack. And it was very much like editing a movie. And, uh, you know, it's 480 pages. Uh, and the book is, 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 you know, it's a coffee table book the size of a coffee table. It's almost a foot tall. Uh, and and there's, uh, we took over 7,000 photographs and finally selected uh, over 1,100 uh, of them are, are, uh, are seen in the book. And uh, there's a great jingle chapter that talks about, you know, a lot of these frustrations uh, and, 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 its, and its revival. And, and you see, and, and, you know, I think my, my attitude about the film is kind of uh, best summed up in my relationship to the 24-inch uh, Turbo Man that we made for the parade. I was given one of them at the end of the production, and I kept it in a box in the garage for 20 years. Uh, a very nice box with padding and stuff. It was protected. Uh, uh, but, you know, I didn't want to see it. And, and things really change so radically. Uh, and, and, it, and it changed my feelings about the film, and I really do enjoy it. And I built a beautiful case for, for that Turbo Man, and I, and, and, I, and I look at him all day, every day in my office. Uh, and it's good, good, to, good to be reunited. Uh, I missed him. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So the, the, we're talking the one at the end of the parade that he gives the Oh, yes, the, the big one. Pra- yeah, 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 yeah the, the that he gives away. Yep, awesome. Yeah, no, good. Oh, I would have had that on display. I'm telling you, this would have been... I'm still chasing. I didn't get one of those... Uh, I'm chasing an original one somewhere because I do love that that character. Well, that, get, just get one without the box, and then buy a duplicate box. I know, but are you? Like, do you take all the toys out of the box? Yes. Yeah. I used to throw the boxes away until I learned better. For years and years, I just throw <laughs> right. them away. Um, <clears throat> I had no use for them. I, I, I had, I'm a very different kind of collector. I, I am not collecting uh, based on condition. I'm not yeah. collecting on complete. Uh, I actually prefer things that uh, were used, were loved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, have <laughs> a know? story behind them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and and, and then it's about it's about number. Uh, you know, and and you know, I get very. I, I when I collect Superman, I only collect Superman figures. No Clark Kent, no Luther, none of that. <laughs> Uh, I just want Superman. My Popeye is almost complete. Just Popeye. No olive oil. No Bluto. No Wimpy. You know, one or two here and there. Uh, but but I just and Herman Munster. Not not Lily. Not uh, Grandpa. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, but but I just love to see all the different uh, versions of them. And and remember, yeah. most of the stuff I collect um, came before the era of very strict. Uh, design standards uh, for for whoever is creating the toys, mm-hmm. the coloring books, whatever. Everything looks the same today. Right. And uh, you go back uh, 50, 40, 30 years even, um, and there were no style guides. It was literally the toy manufacturer or the artist's interpretation of that character. Yeah. And that that's what gives things so a, a, a unique. It's more like fan art is today except they're great toys from japan <laughs> you know they made they made flintstone toys in japan but they didn't even have the series then uh, and then huh. if they did get art it would have been black and white so what color did they you know it's what color yeah. is fred's hair green what color is dino well <laughs> kind of mauve <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah so everyone just, yeah you're right i mean you don't the mass production of everything now you don't get as much of that sort of unique art no in the, in no, the toy. It's, yeah. it's, it's much more in the fan art realm or, or re- yeah. our artists who reinterpret characters. Uh, yeah. Joe Ledbetter kind of Disney stuff is just, is just great, you know? Yeah, and, and no, I, I definitely hear that. Some of my favorite, the movies in the collection that I collect, some of the favorite artwork I have is, is not, it's usually not the theatrical. It's, it's the interpretation by somebody else who creates a unique poster. Like you were talking about Turbo Man one, like yeah. I'd love, I'd love to see that on a case somewhere and sell that well, as, you know, the well, best. well it, cool. you know, 
my my movie Snow Dogs had another awful poster. <laughs> I saw that uh, one in theaters. Good, good. I, I was uh, there for that one. Uh, it, but they had this billboard on the Sunset Strip that was just dog, fa- giant dog faces, and Cuba Gooding yeah. Yeah. with a with, with a with, with a, 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 a a hood with fur, you know, with a fur outline <laughs> around the face in the middle of them, and that was great. And actually, by my complaining <laughs> that that this was so superior, that's what they ended up putting out on the DVD. Okay, I but do. I was going to say, I, 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 that. I, you know, it's like. You know, they showed me the poster for Jingle All the Way, and, and I, yeah, this isn't the movie. We, well, yes, it's kind of the story, but but yeah. it, it doesn't have, I don't know, it doesn't it doesn't kick into high gear, and it was in the background so blank, and stuff, yeah. and, and and Tom Sherrick, who everyone always says was, was a marketing genius, and and. Did a very nice job selling my film. Are we there yet? At a different studio, years later, mm-hmm. um, but 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 he said it's red and white. I go, yeah. He goes, red and white always works. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you need, huh? That's that, that's <laughs> evidently the secret. <laughs> red and white, and, and and nothing upsets me more than than the cover art uh, of the DVD. Where Arnold's looking so dumb. Uh, uh, and, and, and then they did the, the family fun edition, which is actually one of the reasons I have much less service about, about going to see the movie now is, is when I, when I, when I'm going to be at a theater, cause they're showing it a, a revival house. Uh, I asked them to play the family fun edition, which is basically the director's cut. Mm-hmm. Now there, there are things that I have issue with somebody I trusted a great deal who I'd worked with a lot. There were uh, the we were moving Brian Setzer's Jingle Bells from from uh, the montage, which we used a longer version of the montage, to to re, to uh, the Santa Warehouse uh, brawl mm-hmm. uh, uh, because the music we had we added things back so it no, so the music no longer fit and that was great energy and stuff and uh, and and this guy uh, when he when he when he. I had to go to like one of my kids' birthday parties. Said, Don't worry, about it. I got you. You can trust me. It, 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 the music's much too low, <laughs> and so that's the only thing that kind of rankles me. And there's there's a shot, you know. I was talking about color timing earlier, mm-hmm. and and uh, you know, at the very last time we saw the film, there was one shot that was too bright, right? And I said, could you could you bring that down a point? That was, I learned, you know, a little bit of the lingo over the years. Uh, no problem. You know, the guy makes a note. And then when I see the film, he went, he, he gave it another point. He made it a, a even brighter. <laughs> and, and, and so I try not to let those kind of little things bother me. And instead, try and enjoy the film with everyone else. And enjoy, and, and enjoying seeing, you know. Sinbad has you know, been devastated by a stroke, so so active and and, and, and energetic, and, yeah. and, and and funny, and and Arnold before politics, before <laughs> before the heart surgery, uh, uh, and, and and Jake Lloyd as an innocent uh, uh, boy before George Lucas ruined his life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, and Our, uh, and and, Star Wars and fans Phil, in general, and Phil and Bob Conrad, you know, who yeah. who, uh, who had a very serious stroke towards the end of his life and moved back to Chicago where he was from, and uh, uh, you know, and Martin Mull is still going strong, and uh, thrilled mm-hmm. to have him in, in the film. I used to I saw him for the first time uh, when he was a musical act, um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, playing playing at a club in Chicago. Uh, uh, and uh, so you know, it, it, it's fun to see it now. I'm so glad it has be- become a staple. Uh, oh yeah! I'm so glad that people embrace it and uh, that it's going to be around for a while. Maybe in, in like 1999, I got a letter from Fox saying you will never get yearly profit and loss statements on this movie because this movie will never be <laughs> in profits. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I'm wondering about that now. <laughs> I mean, you know, that yeah, was, it's, that was, it's that was a long, a long time be, be, before, before 
there were marathons uh, uh, yeah. on cable uh, uh, and and the Blu-rays and the continued theatrical showings and constant cable sales. And what, what I have learned about the aftermarkets is a film with, with a top name is, is always viable in the marketplace in some way, shape, or form. And, and, and this has been much more durable, I think, than they would have ever anticipated. I'm sure, you know, by, by the time they issued that, most of, most of the copies, of, uh, most of the prints were, were guitar picks. Uh, <laughs> so so um, maybe, maybe I'll ask my lawyer to ask them for a statement. Huh? This podcast may be very helpful to, to, to my yeah, children's I, future. <laughs> from everything I'm seeing, I don't know how it couldn't have by now turned. You know, it's, it's just come <laughs> such a long way. And it is just this perfect, for me, it's just this perfect snapshot of like, that time period and every, everybody who's in it obviously contributes to that too. And that yeah, it, yeah. it's, it's just this perfect nostalgic it's, snapshot. It's starting to get, it's starting to look old pay phones. <laughs> I know, I know. And you have pay to explain, phones. Everybody's but, communicating by pay phones. Right. And by the know, time the I show it to we, my we, kids, I'll have to yeah, explain. Yeah, yeah, but, you'll have to explain what a pay phone is, you know, right. uh, it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just, I, it, I love, and when it's, we it's used to there. shoot film, we used to shoot films on film. <laughs> right, right. Which now I have to, I explain that to people many times in my talks about how they restore films for Blu-ray and 4K and how, yeah. you know what, this stuff that's shot on film actually looks fantastic if you go back and restore it because it's such high quality, you know, it's just almost right. unlimited resolution sometimes. And so it's, yeah, it's just great. And yeah, but this yeah, movie no, has we, a lot. We lost that. something there. We lost something. It was that going digital was supposed to be a time saver. Right. It has not been a time saver. It hasn't saved a minute. You know? <laughs> Anyways, this has been fun. I thank you. I hope people yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, no, I, I have one more question before I let you sure. go because it is a quick one. But I do want to know as a guy who loves, I love all these restorations. We've now got 4K Blu-rays, right? Yeah. Is there is there any chance of of our of our favorite jingle all the way coming to that format? Going back to the original film, doing a full you know HDR color grade and bringing that into a new world, a new audience. Wow, uh, uh, I don't know. You tell me how how large is is that that market now? Well, I think for the right, it's 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 a collector's market. It's a niche market right now, but for the right movie, like Warner Brothers just did Elf, Christmas Vacation, Polar Express, and A Christmas Story on the 4K format. And from everything I've heard, they, they put them out a couple of weeks ago, right before Christmas. They're doing very well. It has to be that type of movie that has that, you know, that has the cult following or the nostalgia behind it that people uh, I'm, I'm just hoping that uh, my film a christmas story 2 <laughs> finds right. favor although actually i saw that that was that was uh that was a top pick on uh on, on uh, uh, hbo max uh last week so maybe it mm -hmm. is catching on finally uh but yeah no i i i, I will probably one day uh, ask uh, someone over at Disney if they have any plans. And if so, I'd like to fix that music and that one shot and it, get them right. to only issue the, uh, the director's cut. I, I think it would do really well. I'm so, I, I talk about this movie and I always thought I was sort of in the minority of like, Oh, this is just, you know, that weird movie from your childhood that I saw that I loved. Nobody else saw it. And I have connected with so many people over it. I, you know, it's, there's dozens of us. We're all out there. There's millions. There's, of I, us I hope there's movie. millions of you. <laughs> there's millions of us that love this movie. And this this all was right. just yeah. It it was such a piece of childhood, and it's it's up there with with Elf and A Christmas Story and Christmas Vacation, the stuff that you're gonna watch every year over and over again. I just I love it. Please so, do. <laughs> yeah. No. Absolutely. And I can't wait to show my kids. And I I think I mentioned in emails when we had our covid christmas in 2020 we rented a, we rented a theater and that was the movie i picked yeah. i said you guys have to see jingle all the way and my whole family and nephews and you know cousins sat down and watched it and it was awesome so 
uh, it still holds up even for the the eight year olds who are watching it then. They like if they it. just it get, can figure out what a payphone is, we'll be great. That was we had to do a little <laughs> explaining. Yeah, when you ask them, hey, what's a phone look like? They don't do this and, anymore. And, and and tell and before you could go on Amazon and order something. Right, right. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, um, your book is is really cool too. I can't wait to. Uh, I'm probably going to grab a copy. I know you sent me a, a digital version of it, which is cool. But I'm a I like to have the copy, so I'll go and order I, one a physical copy of it. And uh, yeah, it's just incredible. The pictures and the, the collection and I mean, what what a collection you have. So I definitely would recommend people go out and check out that book because if they're listening here, they're probably collectors too, just like me. So <laughs> it'll definitely speak to you whether you're collecting, you know, whatever, movies, books, toys, albums, whatever it is. It's you they're know, all in there. It's yeah, all in there. <laughs> yeah. And it's really unique and it's awesome to see, you know, just the, the passion and all the stories that are in it too. You know, it's a little bit. I would say it's a little more than uh, most coffee books. It might just have some pictures. There's a lot of good stories and behind, you know, writing in it as well. So it was really well done. Thank you. And, uh, All right. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on. This was great. Thank you so much. This fulfilled the childhood. Uh, uh, the you're, you're my number one customer. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. And on that, we should go. All, All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. All right, so that's our interview with Brian Levant, director, writer, producer, extraordinaire, who definitely made if you're if you're my age, if you're in your 30s, Brian made movies that probably made your childhood. Beethoven, Flintstones, Jingle All the Way, even Snow Dogs and Are We There Yet, if you're a little bit younger. Those were big movies. He was heavily involved in a lot of different really cool stuff. And, you know, his career goes way, way back. And he was just super fun to talk to. Really fun guy. Has an amazing collection that you'll see behind him if you're watching the video that he talks about. And I definitely would recommend his book because it is a really interesting piece. And, you know, whether you collect movies or books or music or toys or stamps or whatever, you're going to really relate to his stories behind his collection and like how it's grown. And it's a really interesting look. Not many books do that. Like people dive into their, their collections like that and talk about why they're so passionate about it. So it's really, really cool and definitely go and support him. I'll put the Amazon link uh, to purchase his book in the description would make for a great Christmas gift, last minute Christmas gift, or, you know, whatever, uh, a gift for a toy collector, a great coffee table book. If you just love pop culture and things like that. So definitely would recommend it. I got a copy from Brian to check out and it's, it's well worth a read. So thanks for listening and or watching. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube if you want more like this. Mm -hmm. And if you're on the podcast apps like Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, whatever, leave a five-star review if you enjoyed this. Follow the channel there. And we'll be back after the new year with uh, another episode. I'm taking a break here from Christmas through the New Year's. But after the New Year's, that first week in January, we have a new episode with a really cool guest. I'm not going to spoil it yet. I don't want to give it away, but let's just say we're going to get deep into the Criterion Collection. And this is a guy that a lot of people had recommended I talked to. He's a YouTuber, and I'm really, really happy that I was able to connect with him. So stay tuned for that episode. But thank you to Brian for his time. Go check out his book, support him. And thank you all for listening and watching. Have a great holiday season, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever you're up to. Have a great holidays. Enjoy the time with family and friends. Stay safe and healthy out there. And I'll talk to you all soon. Coming soon. Be sure to subscribe to the Films at Home podcast using your favorite app so you don't miss another episode. And while you're there, don't forget to rate and review this podcast, which helps us out tremendously. You can also help support us by watching our short form content over on YouTube and TikTok by searching Films at Home. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at films underscore at underscore home. The intro and outro were created by Elon Osborne. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.